Today is August 15th, 2024, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Linwood Tawheed. Dr. Tawheed is an associate professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Dr. Tawheed is also a past president of the National Economic Association, the NEA, which was founded in 1969 as the Caucus of Black e Economists. And Dr. Tawheed is also a freaking guest on one of our favorite radio shows, The Critical Hour, with Dr. Uh, Wilmer Leon and Garland Nixon. Dr. Tawheed, thank you so much for coming back on the show and welcome back to the show. Thank you, Ryan. It's always a pleasure. Uh, interviews are always um, a good time. Well, it's, it's an honor to have you back on. I guess our first question is about the, the Japanese stock market crash on Monday, August 5th, the rapid unloading of Japanese stocks continued following a tumultuous weekend. Japanese stocks suffered their biggest losses since 1987, mm -hmm. with the Nikkei uh, uh, 225 index losing a staggering 4,451 points and closing more than 12% down. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tauhi, while there has been some bounce back since August 5th, how significant was this fine? How significant was this financial crash, and what is this signaling about the health of not just the Japanese economy? but the U.S. economy and the global financial market more generally. Okay, let me, let, me, let me start by saying I'm certainly not an expert in the Japanese economy, but I do think this event was significant. Uh, there are some things to remember about the Japanese con economy is one, uh, the Japanese economy has been bumping along with, with pretty close to zero growth for, for over two decades. And uh, the Japanese in 1999 instituted what is called a zero interest rate policy, a ZERP, uh, where the Central Bank of Japan set interest rates near zero. In fact, they have been uh, negative interest rates. Now, think about that. You, you can borrow money in a Japanese bank, if you have the ability to do that, I, you and I can't do it, but 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 with with uh, certain certain uh, entities can, they borrow money and pay back less than you borrow. And the Japanese did that to try to stimulate their economy. Uh, we're, we're talking about Japanese banks in a system in which the government plays a significant role in in boistering banking. And the Japanese uh, version of capitalism is uh, significantly different in that way from the, uh, the, the American and Western version of capitalism in that uh, banks uh, view themselves as, as supporters of business. And so Japanese businesses have been able to borrow money and keep people employed. And um, those zero interest rates were taken advantage of by Western companies that could do that, Western investors who would borrow money in the Japanese, uh, uh, from Japanese banks at essentially zero or slightly negative even interest rates, and then use that money to, to buy safer uh, profit-making investments in, in the West, like government bonds, US bonds, or invest in the stock market in the West. And it's, uh, you know, as long as you, you get your principal back, you're good, and um, uh, so so uh, at least for two decades here, well, two almost almost two and a half decades, uh, Japan has has instituted this zero interest rate policy, and that has recently been backed off by the Japanese. Uh, they did a first um, ending of that policy in May of this year, May of 2024. Uh, but the interest rate went from slightly negative to about zero, but it was a backing off. And then in July, end of July this year, they went to a quarter of a point, quarter of a percent interest rate. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but if you've borrowed billions of dollars in the West um, and and uh, you've uh, taken that money, let's say, invested in the, in the, in the stock market, uh, and you are over leveraged in that. Let's say you 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 are borrowing into options, or something like that. Uh, going from a zero interest rate to a quarter of a percent means you have to start paying interest on that money, whereas before you didn't. And so 
Western companies and investors that had uh, purchased, that had borrowed money at um, a zero interest rate, needed to get a hold of, of yen and uh, to, well, need to get hold of dollars to, to, to then uh, convert into yen uh, to begin to paying those interest rates. Uh, that, that caused a, a, a run on Japanese yen. Uh, the yen began to appreciate. It began to increase in value relative to the, to the U.S. dollar. And, and that, that caused a, a run on, on the stock market in, in terms of, of uh, companies um, selling their, their stock portfolios in order to get, get yen to, to pay back uh, that uh, small interest rate, but a quarter percent or a billion dollars is a lot of money. And so, and so that that this is the way I understand it. And they say I'm not a, not an expert, but but in looking at and, and listening to some people who do have more knowledge about it, this is the way I understand uh, that uh, that this this thing has unfolded in August here, because the Japanese have gone have gone away from their zero interest rate policy, and they are signaling the Japanese are signaling that they are going to continue to raise their interest rates. And so that gravy train, in a sense, is coming to an end. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, then affecting not just the Japanese market. The Japanese are, are trying to, to stabilize their economy. And uh, they've, they've been able to do that, in a sense, by making borrowing of Japanese money, of yen, cheap for Japanese companies. But it also made, made it cheap for, for Western companies. And that's, that's coming to an end. And so uh, that's going to continue to have these these reverberations. The up and down that you find in the Japanese stock market and in the Western stock market, because the Western, the Nikkei opens, uh, the Nikkei, the Japanese stock market opens, uh, I think, 12 hours or so before the, uh, the, the uh, U.S. stock market, uh, Wall Street here, opens. And so many times what things that happen in the in the in the east in in uh, the Nikkei in particular, uh, bodes uh, well gives gives signals for what's going to uh, what might happen uh, when the U.S. stock market opens and and it did, and so the U.S. stock market opened and followed trend as persons are are selling stock to get money to convert the yen to pay interest rates off because they were leveraged, uh, highly leveraged in those situations. Uh, that then stabilized uh, the next day. Well, well stabilized because the, the sell-offs, uh, which caused the downturn in the stock market, Japanese and U.S., um, began to recover because people then began to buy now lower price stocks. And, and my understanding is that there was significant borrowing by companies to buy stock or uh, in their own stock or other stocks. And so companies became even more leveraged in that process, which is a setup for further ups and downs in the market, high volatility in, in, in the market. So the fact that there was a recovery doesn't mean that everything is okay. It means that that, that persons are buying into the market to sell. You know, if, 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 if your stock, stock yesterday was $100 and it dropped, uh, you know, two uh, percent down to ninety-eight, and people are buying it at uh, at ninety-eight to do two things: one, to keep it from falling further, but also uh, hoping that it's going to go back up. And it does go back up. Let's say to ninety-nine, and you sell and you make a dollar per stock. Well, that's also a sell-off, and so that's going to cause a drop. So we'll continue to see the volatility here. Uh, so these these recoveries are not really recovery. One of, one of the things that, that uh, uh, your, your, your uh, viewers uh, should know and probably do is that it, we should not take an indication of what's going on in the stock market, Wall Street, as an indication of what's going on in what we would call the real economy. The stock market is very easy to manipulate uh, if, you, if, you've got, if you've got the money to do it, right? And so buying and selling stock is sometimes done on purpose, selling stocks to, to cause a, a, a sell-off and a lowering of stock prices only with the intention of buying low 
and then selling high later and so forth. There's this process of, of arbitrage where people will, will look for opportunities to take advantage of, of volatility and, and, and differences in, in prices of goods and, and so forth uh, from one day to the next or at the same time, buy here, sell there. And um, that's, that's manipulation, but it's, it's legal. Uh, and it's even more exacerbated by the fact that uh, much of the trading in the stock market, the big trading is done electronically, is done by computers, uh, not by human beings who are you know, sitting by their, their, their screen looking at stock prices go up and down, but by computerized systems that can see the instantaneous ups and downs and buy low, sell high, or sell high and buy low, either way. Um, you can you can make a, a lot of money in a in an hour, if not minutes, by uh, by doing uh, by by having le electronic trading going on. So so the, the Wall Street is not generally an indication of of how the how Main Street is doing. Uh, although there are times when that happens. For example, you might have noticed that many times when the unemployment rate goes up, the stock market has a rally because uh, companies are associating increases in unemployment rate with decreases in labor costs, which means increases in profitability. Uh, that happens all the time, but sometimes things get so out of sync, if you will, between the two that um, uh, things that are bad for the stock market are also bad for Wall Street, uh, excuse me, Wall, uh, also bad for Main Street. Thank you for that that explanation. And, and and one of the things I've been hearing in the news about the the financial crash in Japan was the carry trades play played a pivotal role. Is that what you were describing in the beginning? Yeah, the carry trade in terms of of, of the arbitrage, buying and selling, uh, in, in you know buying buying stock, not to to hold on to it, but to watch the drop and then sell it um, uh, you know, when it when it recovers. Um, as opposed to buying stock to hold on to it to, to hopefully increase the productivity of the country of the country of the company, uh, the carry trade is uh, you know we we are simply buying and selling uh, just it's just a financial transaction. It's not a, a, a intended to increase the productivity of the company, which is where why, why we the way that we're taught to think about investing in stock. You invest in a company. And you hold on to that stock uh, for the purpose of uh, because you think that company has a good future, and the stock value will be increased in the in the future, and so you're going to hold on it to increase your wealth. Uh, and in this case, uh, there is a uh, you know um, not that intention. It's intention simply to to buy when you think it's low and to sell if it's you know in a couple of hours if the price if the, the value goes up you're going to sell and um, just to make a profit. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, you know, that seems, you know, problematic, inherently problematic, but it's definitely a feature of capitalism. I guess, you know, sw switching gears a bit, um, the U.S. has also instituted a series of economic sanctions against its alleged foes, including most notoriously Russia, as well as countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Nicaragua, and the list goes on. But before we dig deeper into the impact of these sanctions, can you give us an intro or sort of a nuts and bolts 101 into what U.S. sanctions are and how they work? Okay. Uh, what, uh, sanctions are, are um, um, enforcement or, or restrictions on business uh, opportunities or financial transactions that um, uh, a country will make a, against either other countries or other individuals or certain products or services. And so, for example, in the case of the U.S. sanctions, uh, well, the Western sanctions, not just the U.S., but U.S. And, and European sanctions against Russia because of Russia's special military operation in, in coming into Ukraine. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first sanctions that were um, uh, thought of was to, to sanction Russian oil uh, sales. Uh, Russia is a, a, a significant supplier of oil. 
uh, oil, oil sales are a big part of the Russian economy, as well as uh, sales of things like, um, like um, um, uh, wheat and other kind of grains and cooking oils and um, um, uh, chemicals, uh, raw materials for fertilizers and, and other kinds of things. Those were part of the first sanction packages that NATO and the, that, excuse me, that EU and the West uh, um, put on Russia, the company, the country of Russia, um, uh, supposedly to, to punish it for its invasion of Ukraine uh, with an idea, and this is, this is not a secret any longer, the intention of putting these sanctions on was to uh, collapse the Russian economy to cause immiseration of Russian citizens, to cause them to become unrestful against the Russian government, and hopefully then to engage in an overthrow of Vladimir Putin. Regime change was the intent of those sanctions. In addition, the sanctions were not only against uh, the, the Russian, uh, Russia itself in terms of these products, but there were also then significant sanctions put on wealthy Russian oligarchs, preventing them from engaging in financial transactions in the West. And um, um, you know the the oligarch situation in Russia is is an interesting one. We should probably talk about that. But but let's let's not forget that uh, what is uh, what is called an oligarch when it when it's Pointing to Russia is is a billionaire in the in, in the West. Uh, the, we have the West has their oligarchs also. In in fact, uh, we would really think of the U.S. Uh, the West as an oligarchy, as opposed to a democracy. And so we have these oligarchs, persons who have billions of of, of dollars in Russia. Uh, some of which was obtained in nefarious ways and which the, the, uh, the, the Putin government has been trying to deal with. But um, uh, many of these oligarchs uh, have their uh, billions not in Russia, but in, in Western banks and Western uh, entities. And so the sanctioning against those individuals was to prevent them from having access to their money or engaging in Western transactions. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the, well, there's some side effects that we should talk about to that uh, that occurring and side effects to the sanctions in general. But sanctions uh, of, of this type are preventing trade of certain goods and services uh, uh, to be purchased or, or, or sold from Russia to the rest of the world. There's also another kind of sanctioning uh, in terms of tariffs that are, are, are put on, on uh, goods and services where uh, mostly goods where instead of preventing the sale of a particular good uh, uh, from, from uh, a country that is you know, considered to be um, an enemy, uh, the, the, there's an extra tax, a tariff that's put on that product. And uh, so if you, you know, the, the, the product can still be sold uh, from a tariffed country into the US, but the price of it is going to be um, Increased by the by the amount of the extra tariff, with an with an intention of of slowing down the sale of that product, and so that's another kind of sanction. Uh, call it's not a complete um, um, elimination of the trade of that uh, uh, of that item of that product, but it is uh, an increase in the price of that product to slow down the trade. Thank you, thank you for that answer. I guess as a follow up, you know. Um, you know, is it is it an overstatement to say that the U.S. sanctions against Russia have been sort of a self-inflicted wound on the U.S. and that they have not been effective? Yeah, they 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 have not been effective. You know, sanctions when when the when Russia was the Soviet Union, uh, sanctions had a tremendous, I think, effect on on keeping the Soviet Union from growing its economy. Um, and uh, so there were things that were, were uh, in, in short supply in the Soviet Union, and, and that's not just a result of the sanctions, but, but a result of, of, of the, the Soviet Union not being able to 
produce those products uh, that were being sanctioned on its own. Uh, Russia, the, the, the Russia is not the Soviet Union, <laughs> although the, 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 the thinking uh, in terms of sanctioning this, uh, Russia for its, uh, you know, uh, perceived uh, malicious action, uh, perceived malicious action, that is, perceived action that, that is, you know, perceived to be for no, for no reason, uh, Russia is invading Ukraine either for no reason or for the reason of wanting to conquer Ukraine. That that certainly is not what what uh, the, uh, the, the the Putin administration has said, and the evidence is that uh, the, they they had significant um, reasons to to go into Ukraine. We can talk about those um, that were understood in the West, um, and uh, but but uh, the. The, when the sanctions were put on uh, the Russia, it was assumed that it would have the same effect that those sanctioning sanctions had on the Soviet Union. Uh, but what it has done is caused the Russia to be. It took it took a, a minute, uh, a year or so, for the Russians to kind of get their feet under them, to realize that if they weren't going to to uh, be able to buy and buy and sell products from the West, uh, particularly buy products from the West, that they needed to be put themselves in a position to be able to produce those products for themselves. Uh, a, a good example uh, is, uh, you know, uh, and, and because the, the, there has been uh, at least a couple of decades of, uh, of good financial and international business relationships between Russia and the West, the Russians have learned how to produce those products that uh, they were, were, were purchasing from the West. And so a good example of that is uh, a company like, uh, uh, like McDonald's with the restaurants in, in Russia uh, because of the sanctions closing down their operations in Russia. And so McDonald's leaves Russia, but of course they, they, they're not taking their stores with them. Uh, the stores are still there. The customers are still there. The workers are still there. And uh, as far as I know, the ingredients for the secret sauce are still there. <laughs> and, so, and so the McDonald's closes one day and the next day it opens up as an Uncle Sasha. Uh, restaurant selling selling uh, you know what would be a, a equivalent of a Big Mac, but it's under new under new management. It's under new ownership. It's under Russian ownership, and the Russians don't miss a beat. Employees go to work. Customers come in. They buy uh, you know burgers that uh, that are you know uh, have have actually the the formula has actually been been. Uh, um, uh, chains to to the to the Russian taste, and 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 the burgers don't take taste any different from one day to another. Uh, the same thing happened in many many products where the Russians, because of of making those products in Russia, have learned how to do that. And as a result of that, they've been able to to uh, to 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 push back on the sanctions. It it had a, a, an effect. In uh, 2022, uh, the, um, the the Russian economy. Let me see. Make sure I get my number here. Uh, Russian economy uh, w w went was uh, down. The GDP was down 2.1 percent in 2022, and then in 2023 it grew by 3.6 percent. And so it took them uh, a year by these numbers to to recover. Uh, to to get them themselves uh, back in in um, in a growth mode, but uh, but this is this is not the Soviet Union. They they have learned how to produce uh, the products and and services that the West would have uh, uh, had had learned how to produce, uh, and uh, they they didn't they you know they they missed the step, but then they 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 caught up. Uh, in addition, uh, part of the economy, of course, uh, is, you know, uh, the, uh, Russia is not officially in a war economy. 
but it is has increased its war production, its reproduction of, 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 of weapons significantly. And one of the things that allowed them to do that is that, I guess, according to the Soviet system uh, of, of manufacturing, particularly of, of weapons, uh, Russian factories were always under full capacity. That is, they, you know, you have a factory that can produce a certain number of, of, of artillery shells. And in a regular basis, you run that factory at 50% or 25%. But if you need to increase production, double it or quadruple it, you have the machinery there, you have the, the, the facilities there to do so. All you need is the workers and, and, and Russian workers are, are well educated. And so you have uh, uh, Russian workers who uh, would uh, come into the factories and put in an extra shift or two to increase their war production. That increases gross domestic product. In addition, you have lots of foreign workers uh, from the, uh, the southern region of, of, the, of the, the Caucasus regions, uh, the southern Eurasian countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, who are also now sending workers, uh, skilled workers, into Russia and increasing their, their military production. So the increase in military production for Russia has not been a diversion of civilian production into the military. The civilian production is continuing on and their military production is, is able to increase because they had the capacity and the skilled workers to do so. So, so this is not, uh, uh, the, the, the Russian economy is, has, has grown uh, uh, 2022, uh, three and, and projected to grow 2024 at a faster rate than it was growing before, before the sanctions. Uh, so the sanctions are not, not only not working, but the sanctions are also having the political effect of teaching the Russians that they cannot depend on the West, that they have to be more and more independent. Uh, and there are not many partners. Well, there, there are, uh, let me back up. There are lots of partners in the US, in the, in the world that Russia can do business with, but they're not in the West. And so we find that Russia, uh, you know, uh, Putin has made a statement kind of generalizing here that for, for decades, he was hoping that Russia would be accepted by the West as a certainly as Europe as another European country, but they see that that's not happening, and so they're real. They're they're you know identifying themselves as a Eurasian country, and that's where they see their future. And so they're they're of course making closer ties with with China, and China over its 50 year of history of economic relations with the West. Uh, since uh, I think it was '68, when when um, when uh, Nixon went to China and opened up China. Uh, since then, there have been you know, e economic and relationships with with the Chinese, with the West, and the Chinese have certainly learned how to produce things and have become a manufacturing powerhouse. As manufacturing has left left the U.S. and, and gone to China, and so the Chinese as a manufacturing powerhouse. And Russia, as a vast, vast territory with lots of raw material, have, are creating a union that uh, will make them very self-sufficient and able to to resist any sanctions that are going to be that have been put on them or will be put on them. Particularly since the majority of the world is now um, becoming trading more and more trading partners with with uh, the Russia, China, the BRICS, uh, the, um, the, the Eurasian um, uh, Economic uh, Union, and, and so forth and so on. And so, uh, yes, not only has the, have the sanctions, uh, the US sanctions and the European sanctions uh, caused a, a uh, say, you know, uh, caused a shooting in the foot of those of those uh, countries, but it's also spurred the, the majority of the world to realize that the West is not a good economic partner. Thank you for that uh, detailed answer. And I guess this is sort of a repetitive question, but um, you know, how, how have the sanctions 
against Russia impacted Europe, the European economy, for instance? Yeah, and, and it's a continuation of, of what we were saying. For example, one of the, you know, the major sanctions uh, uh, against Russia were uh, in the energy areas. Um, um, Germany, for example, uh, was has, was the engine of Europe, the economic engine of Europe. It was the the, the big economy in Europe. Uh, France is, was was the second largest economy in Europe, and I think Italy was the third. Uh, because of the sanctions, particularly the sanctions against the purchase of energy, mostly oil and gas, uh, from Russia. Uh, Russia was providing very cheap oil and very cheap gas to Europe. Uh, because of that, uh, that, that cheapness of, the, of energy flowing into Germany, Germany was able to become a manufacturing powerhouse um, and uh, manufacturing all kinds of, 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 of equipment, uh, heavy, heavy equipment, medical machinery, um, uh, other kinds of things, very, not, 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 say, not very, not specialized in, in a sense that uh, German, co German countries were, were known to be, you know, very exacting in their, in their production process. Well, the Germans have had to shut those factories down because they can't get the gas and the oil that they need to keep those factories, uh, those manufacturing units running. And so uh, Germany is in a recession. And because Germany was the biggest economy in Europe, it's uh, uh, having spillover effects in, in other countries in Europe. And in those other countries are having their own effects because they're uh, unable to buy uh, cheap oil and gas from, from Russia. Uh, even though there are sanctions against oil, there's still oil flowing <laughs> from from Russia uh, into into Europe. Uh, there is, in fact, a pipeline uh, that transports oil from Russia through Ukraine into into Germany, into Poland and Germany. I think Poland, but but I'm certain about Germany. And that oil is still is still flowing. I suppose that um, that uh, the exclusion from sanctions for that is that uh, the, the Ukrainians are uh, get transit fees. They get paid by the Russians for for the use of Ukrainian territory to transport that oil. And so that sanction, if that were completely cut off, would actually penalize Ukraine much more than Russia. In addition, the the oil business is is an interesting business in terms of you know oil that comes out of the ground in russia uh can be on its way to wherever it goes can be can be changed into oil from somewhere else so for example uh and i, I don't have the numbers exactly right but but if a gallon of oil leaves russia and somewhere along the line gets gets mixed with a half a gallon of oil from somewhere else uh, that oil no longer is can, can be considered oil from Russia. It's considered oil from somewhere else. And so that's happening with, uh, with uh, uh, tankers on the open seas are exchanging oil from other places with with uh, uh, you know mixing it with Russian oil, and that oil eventually ends up in Europe, even though it's being sanctioned. Uh, you can't buy oil from Russia, but you can buy oil from a freighter that has mixed oil with somewhere else. But of course that increases the price of that oil. That transaction at sea is not, not costless. And the company that is uh, taking the oil from, from Russia and, and uh, renaming it uh, is also one, going, to, going, to, going to be paid. In addition, uh, Russia has, has a very active oil trade with, with India in that oil is going from India, from Russia to India. And that transaction is being done in rubles and rupees. And we should talk about that as opposed to dollars, which would be the standard medium for, for oil, the petrodollar. Uh, that's not being done in dollars anymore. But that oil flows into India. And Indiri has, India has uh, uh, created uh, refineries. Uh, systems in in India, which they didn't have much of before, but an increase in in refining that oil and reselling it into Europe. 
So it's actually created a, an increase in economic um, activity uh, for India because of the sanctions that, that oil is still getting, oil and gas is still getting to Europe. Uh, it's just uh, going going through the middle middle passage, if you will, in getting there, uh, but but not as much as it was before, and so that's causing a, a, a downturn in in the European activity. And and for a while, um, uh, Europe was was buying a U.S. Uh, liquid national gas LNG um, gas um, to to replace the, uh, the the gas it wasn't getting from Russia. But the but the prices on the Euro, on the Euro, on the um, U.S. gas were were exorbitantly high, and the Europeans have found it easier to buy um, um, gas from other places uh, that's tra- being in transit from from Russia into Europe as opposed to buying it from the U.S. So so this is causing a a tremendous reorganization of of, um, of international trade. Uh, as a result of the sanctions, but but trade is still going on between Russia and the West. It's just not going on uh, in the way that it was going on before. Yeah, thank you for that detailed answer. It, it seems that Russia has just sort of outmaneuvered the U.S. and the West, and not only have they regrouped and got and become more intelligent, but also now you know, yeah. the West and Europe in particular are, are paying a higher price for the oil that they were paying before. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, one of one of the first one of the first moves that 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 uh, uh, Russia made, Putin Putin made, uh, his uh, Treasury Secretary, Admini- Treasury Minister, I forget forget her name, made, was uh, w- right after the sanctions uh, were were put in place, um, uh, uh, the Putin administration announced that uh, they would no longer take dollars for oil. Uh, so even if Europeans wanted to buy oil, they were sanctioning them. They had to they had to find rubles to 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 buy the oil, <laughs> which and the only way you, that that if you're in um, Germany, the only way you get rubles is to sell something to to the Russians, <laughs> who will pay you in rubles, and then those rubles then turn around to 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 buy oil. And so I, I, I would imagine that that dictum is still going in place. The oil that's going through Ukraine to Germany is, is being um, paid for in rubles, which means that the Germans have to find rubles in order to do that. They have to still sell things. So they have to find things that are not sanctioned or they have to find other ways of getting sanctioned goods into Russia to get rubles to then turn those rubles around to buy oil. Uh, yeah, they, they have very much been outmaneuvered. Yeah, I, mean, I believe it, at the beginning the U.S. claimed that they were going to turn the ruble into rubble, and yeah. they've done they've done the exact opposite. Exactly. And, and before we get to de-dollarization, um, you had mentioned China, and as we've seen, the U.S. and the Biden administration in particular have instituted extremely harsh tariffs against China. Mm-hmm. These tariffs already seem like yet another self-inflicted wound. But what is your analysis of how effective these tariffs have been, and and where do you think they're going? Well, in many ways, they caused the, Chi- caused the Chinese to realize the things that the Russians have realized is that they, they need to become more self-sufficient and they need to look for customers elsewhere. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, China, of course, has become a manufacturing powerhouse over the last 50 years or, or so because uh, of the trans the the the. Uh, Trans, uh, with transplantation of manufacturing from from uh, the U.S. in particular to to China because of cheap labor in China, and uh, the Chinese took advantage of that by by uh, providing that labor and uh, allowing uh, Western countries to to build factories in China to do various types of of, of production. But, but the Chinese were, were, were not stupid in that transaction. Uh, they were uh, realizing that uh, it would be better to be able to produce these goods independently of the West as opposed to, to uh, being uh, uh, just a producer for the West. And so, for example, uh, Boeing, uh, you know, Boeing is in the news a lot for other reasons, but but some decades ago, 
Boeing began a, a process of building uh, a, a aircraft manufacturing facility in China. And the, the Chinese not only uh, realized that um, this would, would uh, you know, because what, what the Boeing was looking for, the opportunity to build aircraft in China, because those aircraft would then be purchased by Chinese uh, companies that would do transport and so forth for their, you know, one and a half billion people. Huge, huge market. But the Chinese, uh, you know, had a, a longer term plan. And that plan was to learn how to build aircraft. And so the, in, in learning how to build aircraft from Boeing, and, and at the time, Boeing was a different company than they are now. You would want to learn how to build aircraft from Boeing 20, 20, you know, 20 years ago. You wouldn't want to do that now. But, uh, but they learned how to build aircraft, uh, how to build airplanes, and uh, they then dis disconnected from from Boeing's ownership of their factories into their own own ownership, and that's what happened. That has happened with lots of, of the manufacturing relationships with with uh, Western companies, is that the Chinese have learned um, how to uh, produce these goods and services for themselves. Uh, computer chips is an example, and so when the U.S. began to sanction. Uh, put uh, tariffs and sanctions on Chinese on on companies selling chips to to the Chinese, uh, saying that these chips that were going from Western companies to to the Chinese were being used in military goods, and 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 that wasn't the case because the military equipment was not using state of the art chips. They were they were not they were using older chips that the Chinese knew how to manufacture themselves. But since they could no longer get uh, access to uh, the state of the art chips, it, it uh, forced them to learn how to create these state of the art chips. And uh, leading company in doing that is, is Huawei. Uh, but, uh, and uh, so the, the Chinese have uh, learned that, that they need to become self-sufficient in, in producing these, these, these uh, chips. And, you know, there's, a, there's an order in the in the global economy, in terms of of where things get produced, uh, some things are too expensive to produce at home. If you are a a um, economy that has a relatively expensive labor, so for example, the idea that you know you take uh, you know U.S. T-shirt manufacturing and you move that to China, okay. Um, that manufacturing is not going to come back to the U.S. because U.S. labor is too expensive to make T-shirts. Five-dollar T-shirt would be fifty dollars manufactured in the U.S. Well, the same thing happens when, as, as the Chinese economy grows and Chinese labor becomes more expensive, then the Chinese are going to look to take their clothing manufacturing and move that over to another country that has cheap labor. Uh, that would be maybe a Vietnam. And so you start to get, because China has grown uh, its, its um, uh, economy and uh, has grown its standard of living, um, uh, according to one statistic, Chinese median household income has increased by 700% in the last 20 years. Uh, 800 million people, I was going to say 800,000, but we're talking 800 million Chinese, right? 800 million people in China have uh, moved out of poverty uh, in, in that last 20 years. Well, that means that Chinese labor is becoming too expensive to make t-shirts in China, so that gets shipped off to Vietnam. And Vietnam then starts to benefit from their relationship with, with China uh, in the way that China benefited from its relationship with the West. And, and so you, you see this organization of the, the, you know, the, uh, the Shanghai uh, Cooperative uh, and the uh, Eurasian uh, Economic um, uh, Cooperation uh, uh, process uh, starting to bring in countries so that you have uh, a, a high wage country like, uh, like China is becoming. And then you have a middle wage and you have low wage countries that are that are part of that union. And um, uh, so so you get the expansion, the spread effects 
of that development in China spreads out to other countries in, in, in Eurasia, and you start getting a, a, a buildup of economic well-being in, in all of those countries because of that relationship. So as China is pulling, is being forced actually to, to pull itself away from uh, depending on the U.S. Uh, for, for as, a, as a customer base, uh, that customer base is going elsewhere. And, and the Chinese are, uh, and, you know, the BRICS is a, is a perfect example, we should talk about them, of, of how you begin to organize a group, not of all rich countries, not like the G7, but you, you have a mixture of rich countries and medium countries and poor countries because the economic activity is going to flow up and down that ladder, that economic ladder from one type of, of economy to another. Uh, and you have a, a real opportunity there for richer, rich countries in this context, China, for example, or, or, or Russia, to become better off and for countries below that to also become better off as long as those, those poorer countries are not exploited and all of the wealth heads into the, the wealthy country. That's been, the, been the, the Western model. The Western model is to deploy cheap labor elsewhere and to keep that labor cheap elsewhere in order to, to keep the, the prices of, of, of goods and services, um, of goods transported to the U.S inexpensive for U.S. labor, which needs cheap products because U.S. labor is, uh, you know, much of U.S. labor is not, uh, you know, able to buy uh, uh, high price products. So the, the cheapness of, of the products from China helped, uh, you know, uh, persons of average means or less than average means to, to still have goods and services in the U.S. Uh, but that means that those other countries become stay underdeveloped. That's not the BRICS model. The BRICS model is, uh, at least as is explained, as is expressed, is that all countries should 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 grow uh, the the welfare of their of their members uh, in this arrangement with 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 countries that are at different different stages of of development, and wealth, and, and uh, well being. Thank you for that answer. And yeah, the, the Chinese model is one of common prosperity, whereas the West, yeah. as you noted, is one of the exploitation of yeah. extreme exploitation yeah. and gunboat gunboat diplomacy. Yeah. I guess another over overlapping topic that uh, you've alluded to, if not spoken to directly, is um, de-dollarization. Um, for those that may not be familiar with the term, what is de-dollarization, um, and what impact um, do you think it's having? Well, I guess what impact do you think you know U.S. sanctions against Russia mm -hmm. um, and, and its other U.S.'s other alleged foes and U.S. tariff campaign against China is having uh, mm -hmm. in terms of de-dollarization? Yeah, one of the things, of course, uh, that that was sanctions. One of the entities, the, the processes that were sanctioned was uh, the uh, uh, the Russian access to what is called the SWIFT. Um, SWIFT uh, uh, trading system uh, that keeps track of international trade by keeping track of products going one way and dollars going the other way, dollars or euros going the other way. And so for certain products, we mentioned oil, that, that, that trade is only done, uh, at least in the Western world uh, up until now, only done in dollars, uh, the petrodollar. And that was an agreement that was made initially between um, uh, Saudi company Aramco and the U.S. Uh, right after after World War II, that um, uh, that all trade in, in oil from Saudi Arabia and there that becomes the standard would be done in dollars. So that's what we what we have the, the term petrodollar. Um, when the the sanctions began to be put in place and russia was no longer able to to uh, trade in dollars because it couldn't trade on the swift system uh the the, the russians uh, then came up with an alternative i mentioned uh, them demanding that uh, their oil would only be sold in rubles that's a de-dollarization we're not going to use if we can't buy and sell in dollars then uh, you, you have to buy and sell with us in our own currency. 
uh, but but it, it's expanded because part of part of the problem in the sanctions, one of the um, a, a really not part of a sanction, but but part of a, a, a maneuver by the West was to take about three hundred and fifty billion dollars that that Russia, that Russian companies and, and Russian government had in banks in the West and freeze those, not allowing the Russians to get access to their three hundred fifty billion dollars. Uh, uh, well, three hundred three gold worth three hundred fifty billion dollars, right? You can't get access to this uh, this asset, which is causing other countries uh, that might uh, you know that might think that in the future they may run afoul of the West, that their money that is in let's say sovereign wealth funds or other kinds of funds in the West might also be sanctioned. And Venezuela has had that happen. I think there's $50 billion of Venezuelan money that the Venezuelans can't get access to. Other countries are realizing that having your, your, your assets in the West, in Western banks, and having them denominated in dollars is not a good idea. And so that is causing a, 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 a rethinking of what the standard currency should be for transactions in the world. Now, so moving away from the dollar to something else. Now, what was generally thought would happen because of the, the, the power of, of China is that the yuan, the renminbi, would become the new standard currency for transactions outside of the dollar. That is, Instead of the U.S. dollar becoming the standard of transactions, Remembi would become the standard of transaction, and then uh, everyone would have to find one in order to 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 trade in the system. Which means that you have to buy sell things uh, to to China, you know, and then they they produce one. They're the only only entity that does that. They'll produce the one uh, that you can use in trade. But but that's not what's happening. That's that's what was thought would happen that the the yuan would replace the dollar. But that's not what the BRICS are proposing. What the BRICS are proposing is to set up a system whereby countries can trade in their own currency. Uh, and so, uh, for example, India trading with China and. You know, there are some political uh, barriers to much of that happening, but I think that's going to be worked out. India trading with China can can send uh, um, uh, rupees to China to buy things from the Chinese, and the Chinese can send yuan to India to buy things from India. That is, um, uh, countries would be able to trade in their own currency that they have control of. And so this is really what uh, what I think of as a democratization of, of international finance. Instead of having to find one hegemon's uh, uh, dollar or you know currency and uh, to trade with them in order to get it, then countries can can create their own currency and trade in their own currency. Now the things that have to be avoided is a country providing producing so much of their own currency that really only has what has no value, has no real product or service behind it, just to be able to buy things from else from elsewhere. You have to make sure that those those uh, the, the, the the value of the of that currency is backed up by something that has an intrinsic value. The thing that normally would, that would you know is always thought of as having intrinsic value is gold. But but you don't want to go there because then you end up in, in a system in the uh, early European mercantilist system where there's only so much gold and you have to get it and countries are willing to fight each other in order to get gold, right? You don't want to have that system happening. So you have to make it so that countries that are going to trade have um, can, can create value that backs up their currency, that value can be natural resources, it can be products that they produce, it can be the value of their labor. You know, we mentioned that that uh, the, the countries in the Caucasus and uh, uh, you know that were part of the Soviet Union are sending labor into into Russia to work in the, in the military, 
uh, complex. Well, those workers are are going to be paid. Uh, they can be paid in rubles, but if they're they're coming from uh, and I don't know what the what the what the currency is in Kazakhstan, but but if Russia has Kazakhstani currency, it could pay Kazakhstani workers in that currency because that currency is going to be sent back to Kazakhstan uh, to the families of those workers. And so uh, the trade can be in the in the currency that's natural to that country. And you just have to work, make sure you work out the balance of trade so that you, you don't end up with too much currency coming in that, that a country can spend. That proposal, a proposal to do that was a proposal that was made by uh, John Maynard Keynes back in the uh, 19, um, uh, after World War II, 48, I believe, when, when uh, the, the Bretton Woods system was put in place. And the Bretton Woods system was, was put in place to make the dollar the de facto currency. But um, uh, Keynes had a, a, a concept that he called the Bancor, which be, would be a clearinghouse for, for, uh, for countries' currency that would handle the, the overages and underages that would happen between countries to allow countries to trade in their own currency, not making any one currency the, the standard currency. Uh, that, that, that proposal was rejected uh, uh, and uh, in, the, in, that, uh, in the establishment of the Bretton Woods system. In 2009, the um, chair of the Chinese uh, bank re-raised the proposal of the Bancor uh, system, uh, and he proposed that uh, that system be managed by the IMF, right? Now, we, we could say that the IMF shouldn't be the, the, the entity to do that because the IMF is certainly uh, well established as a Western entity, but, but the Chinese have, uh, have uh, some, some, some me method to their madness, if you will. And so in 2009, when the chairman of the uh, chair of the Bank of China made that proposal of Bancor managed by the IMF, 2009 is also the year that BRICS was started. <laughs> And so it was like we have a we have an opportunity to do something that's good, but if you don't take the opportunity, we're going to do it on our own. And so BRICS was started in in, in 2009. And so what I see the BRICS going to is a Bancor kind of system, which would democratize international transactions of, of no country having to be dependent on another country's currency. Uh, they're only dependent on the ability of their country and their their workers in their country to produce things that need to be that that can be bought and sold. Uh, in a, in a real way, this is this is an interesting as a, a way I think about it in terms of of Adam Smith's um, thinking in the wealth of nations. Uh, and because the wealth of nations, which was published in 1776 was published as a critique of the mercantilist system, which was based on the idea that uh, the wealth of nations is dependent upon the amount of gold in the royal treasury. And uh, since there's only a limit to supply of gold, it meant, meant that countries had to battle each other, uh, and sometimes militarily, to get enough gold to, to maintain themselves as rich countries, otherwise they lose gold to other countries and become poor. And the, the, a, 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 a very, very quick summary of the wealth of nations is that the wealth of nations is not dependent on the amount of gold in the royal treasury, but is dependent on the productivity of the people. And if you get big government and big business, not just big government, big the king, who is giving the, uh, the, mon the, the mercantilist charters and the merchants, the big merchants, East India Company, for example, you get them out of the, the, the transaction process, then the productivity of the people would, would increase. And uh, that is, you know, you, you, you increase the productivity of countries by allowing them to use their own resources and their own people and not be exploited by other other entities and that is as as is being 
propose now uh, the BRICS direction. This is this is you know the BRICS are wanting uh, that uh, you know um, uh, all of these countries that are part of BRICS to to grow and develop and none not to be exploited. And part of that democratization is to allow them to use their own currencies. Well, thank you for that incredibly uh, detailed answer and. A lot of that I was, you know, I, I had no idea about. So I really appreciate that, and we might have to have you back on to have a whole deeper conversation conversation about that or any of these topics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know we're already up on an hour, but just like I guess a, to the extent that it, this is a quick question as possible, but okay. you know, coming coming back around to our first question about the August fifth Japanese stock market crash, do you think that the U.S. sanctions and tariff campaigns? Um, that we've just discussed impacted this financial crisis. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure they did, but I think probably what's what's exacerbating it is, is uh, uh, the the growing, the coming war in the Middle East. I mean, it, it it looks like it is a foregone conclusion that there will be war between Israel and Iran. Now, there could just be a retaliatory strike from Iran on Israel because of its assassination of Ismail Haniyeh in, in, in Iran. Uh, but but uh, it, it, it appears that, the, that Netanyahu and his supporters want war. And it appears that they want war because uh, without that, there is no way for them to continue to hold the Israeli government uh, in control, um, um, a vast majority of the people want Netanyahu gone, and um, uh, even though, <laughs> even though a vast majority, uh, maybe not a vast, but a majority of the Israelis want the war in Gaza, and to call it a war is a is a is a, a travesty. It's the massacre, the genocide in Gaza. They they want that to continue, but they don't want they don't they want Netanyahu gone. And yet Netanyahu realizes that if he has to step down, if he's pushed out of the government, then he has uh, indictments and uh, and uh, other kinds of things that uh, are going to happen, and he'll probably end up in jail. I think he has eight or so of those uh, things happening, and so he has to hold on to government. And I suppose a way to hold on to government is to start a war. And he's then relying on the U.S. coming to his aid if he's going to start a war. But, but but think about what that means to start a war in the area of the world that is the greatest producer of oil. I mean, there's already uh, a, a, a slowing down or stopping of, of transport through the Suez Canal because Ansar al the Houthis in Yemen, uh, a, a small army is able to stop all of that transport uh, and uh, uh, of, of goods that are that are you know, part of the Israeli uh, goods that are going to or from Israel, and that's causing a, a an increase in in transport prices for goods and services that that come by by ship. Uh, if 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 war there shuts down the um, the Strait of Hormuz, the Red Sea. Uh, and other uh, oil access ports, so that there is no oil. And I would, I would suspect. I'm, I, I'm not certain about this, but because of the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the unity that we see among uh, Islamic and oil-producing countries in that part of the world, should there be a war, they, there won't be any oil flowing out of those areas. They will shut down oil. And so you can expect what happens to Germany to happen to. The West, uh, as uh, you know, the, the, that oil will will I'm, I'm sure continue to flow from Russia to to China and uh, from uh, uh, other places into into the East, if you will. But it's going to it's going to continue it's going to stop uh, flow into the West, and um, the, the, that's going to have a devastating effect on the Western economy, which you would think is a reason that the U.S. would prevent Israel from doing this. 
but we'll see um, who's really in charge. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that answer. And I guess that also starts to explain one of the many reasons why the U.S. is interfering in Venezuela's elections so, so heavily. But Dr. Tawhi, those are all the questions we have for you for today. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or discuss before we close? You, 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 you well, you, you mentioned Venezuela, and uh, I had thought about Nicaragua as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 there's an interesting thing that I I just thought about that, of course, transport from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean goes through the Panama Canal. Uh, Panama is a U.S territory. The U.S. has complete control. But but if you look at the map, uh, a canal going through Nicaragua would, would serve as well as the canal going through Panama. It would make trade between China and, uh, let's say, the western, uh, the eastern part of South America much easier. You don't have to. And, and you know, the Chinese, if they're sanctioned and can't go through Panama, uh, going, they, they they either have to go all the way around um, uh, South America, or all the way around Africa, coming coming the other way, coming through the Atlantic, and uh, a a canal through Nicaragua uh, is uh, well positioned to 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 help that trade. So Nicaragua, you know, is not just a matter of oil in those territories, Venezuela and Nicaragua, certainly Venezuela and oil. But but it's also the positioning of those countries in the in the isthmus area, uh, the, the the narrow Central American con, uh, part that makes trade uh, by boat trade by you know uh, transport by boat is cheaper than air in in other ways and uh, and uh, so there is a there is a restructuring of of trade that's also going to have some territorial implications as well. Thank you. So, so something else to talk about. Yeah, no, thank you for mentioning that. You know, Nicaragua does not get mentioned enough, uh, um, both, you know, in terms of what you're discussing and sanctions and um, and everything. Well, Dr. Tawid, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Um, we hope to have you back again soon. You, you know, you dropped so many, you know, uh, nuggets there that we could have, you know, 20 mm -hmm. shows about each of those uh, topics yeah. you discussed. I'm, I'm wanting to learn more about this Bancor system mm -hmm. and how that's going to work. Of course, Keynes, Keynes, Keynes uh, proposed it, but it was just a proposal. Now it has to be put into actual effect. And there are lots of things that have to be worked out in terms of how this is going to work. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the BRICS, the BRICS Plus and the expanded BRICS will, will work this out. And the dollar, the dollar won't disappear. It just won't be as important as it used to be. Yeah, so, so something to talk about as well. Yeah, we definitely need to have more shows about that. We all need to pay closer attention to to what's going on with regards to that and BRICS in general. And the lineup of people trying to sign up to be, or countries, I should say, trying to sign up to be part of BRICS is, is sort of endless at this juncture. Yeah. Um, and as, as Dr. Horn always jokes, you know, if he could, you know, uh, to join BRICS, he would. You know, if they would take yeah. individual members. Yeah. <laughs> BRICS is already 50% of the population of the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Already, you know, so. Well, um, you know, thank you again, and, um, and we look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. <laughs>